Hey everyone, how's it going? I thought today I would hit you with another tag video. I know that I have been doing a lot of tag videos during this vlogmas season, but they are relatively easy to get out into the world quickly because they have a built-in structure. Uh, but this is a tag that I have really had to think a lot about my answers to. I've been kind of mulling over my answers for about a week now to the questions uh, of this tag. And the tag is the Philosophy of Reading tag, which was created by Brandon over at Brandon's Bookshelf, who is a great newer booktuber. Uh, he's awesome, so I'll leave a link to his video. I recommend you go check it out. I was not tagged by anyone, but this tag has been sort of making the rounds on booktube. So I thought I would do it because it has a lot of really meaty questions and a lot of questions that at times are really difficult to answer. So. Anyway, I will jump right in, in the interest of keeping this video short. Uh, so the first question is, what's most important, a good character, plot, or message? Uh, for me, it's definitely character. I need one or two characters in a piece of fiction who I can at least identify or sympathize with. Doesn't mean I need to like them, but I need to somehow get invested in their struggle over the course of the book. But one aspect of literature that the question doesn't mention as a part of literature that is also important to me is the writing. Uh, if the writing is in a book is is bad, then it doesn't matter how interesting the characters are, I'm not going to enjoy the book. If the prose is just sloppy, then I am, am not going to enjoy it. And if the writing goes above and beyond just being, you know, decent English prose and does interesting things with language and becomes sort of a character itself in the story, so to speak, uh, then that is like the best of both worlds. If I can have both great characters and great writing, then that is the holy grail for me. Uh, so that's my answer. Number two, should one read books about ideas or opinions they disagree with? Yes, I think so. I don't necessarily think that we all need to be doing it all the time just because our time is limited. We probably, as intellectual smart people, have a lot of different interests, so, you know, we can't spend all of our time reading up on people whose views we disagree with or who might annoy us and so on, or who we might even find abhorrent. But I think doing it sometimes can be a great exercise for a number of reasons. Uh, for, w for one thing, reading up on views that you don't agree with can help you to solidify what you think, what your views are, and arguments in favor of your own view. It can also just be good when arguing to know precisely what the other side thinks. But another thing that I think is great is occasionally you might actually be convinced. I think it's a great sign of intellectual humility to you know, open yourself up to an alternative view, to give it as much attention as you can and actually be convinced, be shown that you were wrong and that actually this other person, other view was correct. Uh, but then even further than that, even if the opposing view that we're thinking of is something that you would never be convinced of, right? Like, just think of the worst case you could, like white supremacy, right? Or Nazism. You're never going to be convinced that the Nazis were right or that white supremacists are right. But even reading from their perspective can be interesting just from an anthropological perspective, just from sort of looking inside of the heads of these people who hold these views you find abhorrent, can be interesting in its way. Again, doesn't mean we need all need to be spending all, a ton of our time doing it, because again, we have a lot of other things that maybe uh, would, uh, would be better to spend our time on, but I think it still can be extremely interesting. So yes, totally, I think, I think people should. But again, I think we all have a lot of different interests to attend to, so we don't necessarily need to be spending a lot of our time on it, uh, but I think it's good. Uh, number three, as tech advances, what do you think will be the role of books? I think reading will reading books will always be around, uh, even if it's all done on a screen or done in some other way that we can't conceive. I don't think books are going anywhere, even if the reading public grows even smaller smaller than it is right now. I think reading will always be around in some small way. So, yeah. Uh, number four is how important are summaries, reviews, and art in your book choosing? So it's a bit different depending on whether the book is fiction or non-fiction. Uh, I suspect this question mostly focuses on fiction, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer regarding both. So for fiction, what I like is a brief description of what the book is about. So not a full summary, 
certainly not a review or anything like that. But I like to know what a book is about because that will tell me whether or not I'm going to find it interesting. And beyond that, I, I prefer not to encounter reviews, certainly not long written reviews. If I encounter a brief review and like a wrap up on booktube, that's fine. That, that can be fine. But I like my experience of a work of fiction to be as unadulterated as possible. I don't want too many other people's views cluttering my head while I'm forming my own view. Once I've read the book, I'm happy to go read and listen to as many reviews as possible. But when I'm going into a work of fiction initially, I like as little sort of evaluations of it as possible and no full plot summary, usually. And in nonfiction, it's different. With nonfiction, I think some summaries of the content or some background information at least can be really helpful. Especially if the nonfiction book you're reading is kind of difficult, uh, like philosophy for example, which Brandon is a fan of. Philosophy books can often deal in very difficult ideas, and so reading a summary of a philosophical text I think can help you to wrap your head around the ideas and then make it easier to digest the text when you go to read it. But even if you're reading history or biography uh, especially, the books like that, history and biography, tend to throw a lot of information at you. Uh, and so they can be kind of overwhelming if you go in completely cold. So I think it can be helpful to read some background information on whatever subject you're reading a history or biography of, right? Like if you, if you, if you knew nothing about the American Civil War and you just decided you were going to read Bruce Catton's three-volume history of the Civil War, that could probably be a little bit overwhelming if you know nothing about the causes of the Civil War or what the Civil War was about or what happened or the major players involved. So reading a little bit of background information, just reading like the Wikipedia page, I think can be really helpful in just digesting the book and enjoying it more, probably. Uh, and the same thing goes for biography. So uh, that, that's kind of my view when it comes to nonfiction, that summaries, background info can help. Not entirely necessary in every case, right? Like, I don't think you need background info to read a memoir, for example, but in some cases it can be helpful, I think. In terms of art, book art, I do not really care. I have never understood cover buys. I just don't, I don't do it. I don't understand why other people do it. Obviously, you know, live your life however you want, but it's not something that I do. It's not something that I understand. I am almost totally indifferent to cover art or beautiful editions. I can appreciate a beautiful edition when I see it, but I won't buy a book just on that, ever. So, there's that. Uh, number five, should one ever skim or scan a book? Now, here again I need to make a distinction between what I do and what I think other people should do. So, the wording of the question suggests that what Brandon is interested in is should people in general ever skim or scan a book? And, and, th and that's fair. But I'll start with what I do. And so for me, for my own reading life, the only texts that I really ever skim or scan are articles, whether they're academic articles or like newspaper or news articles. Uh, other than that, I'm a sub-vocalizer. When I read, I sound out the words in my head as I'm reading. That's how I enjoy reading. That's how I feel like I can process reading the book properly. And if I try to skim or scan, it just kills all of my enjoyment in reading. It kills my comprehension of what I'm reading. And so I don't like doing it. And in addition, I feel like I can't process a book properly by skimming or scanning. I just feel like if you skim or scan a book, you can't give it the attention that it needs to be fully understood and reviewed. And so I don't do it. I, I, I read every word of every book I read. Unless it's like a collection of pieces and there's a single piece in it that I've read somewhere else. That rarely happens to me because I don't read that many like collections of pieces. But like in a collection of poems maybe, I will skip a poem that I've already read. Uh, but that, that rarely happens, so that's not a big part of my reading life. But in terms of how I view it, looking at other people. I mean, other people can do whatever they want, obviously. If you if you want to skim or scan a book, you know, that's none of my business. What is my business is whether or not you want to review a book, or, you know, evaluate it in any way, uh, or go around claiming to have read it if you've only skim or scanned it. And I don't think if you skim or scanned a book, you really have much grounds on which to evaluate it, review it, 
or even really mark it as read on Goodreads, honestly. Because like I said, I don't think if you skim a scanner book, you're giving it the attention it needs to be comprehended fully. So, yeah, but again, if you're someone who enjoys skimming and scanning, who does it, then that is, that is, that is none of my business. So, you do you. Do you. Uh, so, anyway, moving on to number six, which is should reading, reading always be enjoyable? Again, for me, no. I have read several books where long stretches of them are not all that pleasurable to read, where there are passages that are dull, that are tedious, that are difficult, that are trying, but where the end of the book was so beautiful and so transcendent or so interesting that it made all that struggle worth it, or that it put those difficult passages in a different light, and I grew to sort of like those passages in a weird way. I think something like that happened with Moby Dick by Herman Melville, where there are passages in that when I read it the first time, where I was just like, what is going on? Why am I reading about all this information about whales? Uh, but then the end of it was so profound that it put them in a new light, and when I went back to reread it, those passages were way more interesting. Uh, so, for me, no, absolutely not. I think there are books that demand a little bit more patience than others. Uh, but in terms of a, what other people do, other people, again, you do you. It's your life. Read how you please. Uh, but I think a lot of great books need some patience. You know, I don't think I would have gotten through James Joyce's Ulysses, for example, if I had demanded that the reading always be pleasurable. So, there you go. Number seven is, is it important to be well read? Now, I actually made a whole video about this topic, so I have a lot of thoughts on it. But basically, basically my answer is no. Uh, again, read what you like. Read what's interesting to you. Read what, what resonates with you. I'm not here to tell anyone else to do with their reading life. But I do think that being well-read can be enriching, right? I think it opens up a world of cultural references that are extremely interesting to engage with. And they can, in some small ways, expand your understanding of the literature that you read. And that's not to say that you need to be well-read to understand literature well. I know plenty of people who are not well-read in the sense of having read like the Western canon, who are much better readers than I am. And I, I'm like, sort of, a little bit well-read. Not super well-read, but I like reading classes, classics. Uh, and I, there are people who are less well-read than me who are much better readers, I think. So I don't think you need to be well-read to be a good reader by any means. And I don't think you need to be well-read to have a fulfilling reading life. But I find it interesting to engage with those cultural references that I mentioned. Uh, and in addition, I think that a lot of books are classics with good reason. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. A lot of them are just really good books. And so if you were to spend all of your time reading classics, rather than new releases, for example, you might open yourself up to a world where the proportion of great books to terrible books is a lot more favorable than if you were to read more modern books. So uh, that's another thing I think to take into consideration. So there we go. Number eight is what is your book buying process? I mean, this question assumes that I have one. <laughs> I don't have one. I don't have a book buying process. Sometimes I just find a weird used bookstore and I walk in and come out with five books. Sometimes I go to a Goodwill and happen and it happens to have some books that look really interesting, so I come out with ten books. Sometimes I go to a retail bookstore and buy one book at full price. Sometimes I get drunk and order ten books on thriftbooks.com. <laughs> There's no process. Sometimes I ask for books for Christmas, sometimes I get gift cards. It's all over the place. There's no process. I can't answer this question. <laughs> so, uh, that's, not my, that's a non-answer answer, but my answers to the other questions in this tag are long enough that I think I can get away with at least one non-answer. <laughs> so, number nine is, what is your reading process? And my reading process in terms of getting through books is that I set a certain number of pages that I'm going to read per day, and I do that at the beginning of every week. So, on Sunday, I'm generally thinking, okay, so for Monday through Friday, how many days per week, and how many days each day am I going to read in each book that I'm reading? And that tends to be based on a combination of how busy I am in school and work, and also how challenging the books are. So if it's a, if it's a biography, I'm only going to be reading 5 to 15 pages a day on a weeknight. 
If it's a novel, it might be 20 to 30. Uh, if it's poetry, then I don't tend to do that. I tend to just read poetry when the mood strikes me. But how many pages a day I'll set for myself for a week depends a lot on how busy I am and how challenging the book is. On weekend days, I tend to read a lot more. So, whereas on a weeknight, I might be reading 25 pages of a novel. On a week weekend day, I might be reading 50 pages or something like that. And so that's how I get through books. Uh, and that's how I get through books as consistently as I do. That's why I don't really have reading slumps, because I just say, well, if I'm not feeling reading for today, well then I just need to read 25 pages and I'll get through it and then I can go goof off however much I want. Uh, and it's how, when I get the question of how do I read so much from non-bookish friends, I would just tell them, I read 25 pages a day. I get home from work, I read 25 pages, and then I'm done. And so that's my, that's my process of reading through books. So, there you go. Uh, number 10 is how do you use what you read? Uh, again, I think that like the book buying process question, this assumes that there's any kind of systematic way I go about this. How I use what I read depends on what I read. You know, I love referencing scenes from books in conversation. Uh, you know, I'll just be having fun with friends and I'll be like, oh yeah, there's like that scene in that book, just like we do with movies, right? They're like, oh, it's, that it's like that scene in, in that movie I've seen. Uh, and that's just kind of a frivolous way I, I do it. But I think uh, with nonfiction, I use what I read to learn about subjects I'm interested in, you know, and maybe I'll reference that in a conversation that comes up, but basically it's just for my own mental enrichment, I suppose, mind expansion. Uh, I, I, and I think mind expansion would be the short answer to this question, is I, I use reading to expand my mind, to learn about new stuff, to expand my experience of the human condition when it comes to fiction, and so on. So, I guess that's not much of an answer, but it's a difficult question. So number 11 is, if you could download a book to your brain, would you still read? I think any book that is worth reading in the first place would be a book that you would still want to read even if you could download it to your brain. I would use the analogy of music. So if you could download the sheet music for a song into your brain, I think you would still want to listen to the song. You know, we all get songs stuck in our head, but we still listen to those songs that we get stuck in our head. And I think about it the same way. If it's a good book, then you should want to read it whether you have the content in your brain or not, right? Even if it's history or if it's nonfiction, it should still be well written enough that you want to return to it just to be with the author's voice, right? And if it's if it's not, if once you have it downloaded into your brain, you don't want to read it anymore, then it probably wasn't a great book anyway. So, yes, absolutely. If you can download a book to your brain, I think uh, you 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 uh, or if I could download a book to my brain, I would still read. Hopefully, oh, I would read the good books, I guess. Number twelve is what are your views on rereading a book? I love rereading. Rereading feels like coming home to me, it feels so comforting, uh, it feels warm to me. Uh, it, it's like playing, again, to use the music analogy, it's like listening to that song that you love over and over again. You know, I, I, I love rereading. And it also often, in good books, brings out new qualities in that book that you didn't see on a previous reading, and that is also always a, a joy that can deepen your understanding of the book. So, I love rereading. Number three, what makes a book good? So, this is a difficult question, so I've come up with a very concise answer to it and the question after it. So, what makes a good book is that it does something that is interesting and that it does it well. There we go. Number 14, what makes a book bad? What makes a book bad is that it either is doing something that is uninteresting or doing something that's bad and or that it does it poorly. So a book can be doing something interesting or important, but if it does it poorly, then that's still a bad book. But if it's doing something not interesting or bad, it doesn't really matter whether it does it good or bad. It's just doing something uninteresting or bad, so therefore it's bad. So there are my answers to those two questions. Uh, number 15, how do you feel about not finishing a book? Uh, I tend not to do it. I'm kind of a, a stubborn reader. I, I try to stick with books. And I don't tend to even start a book unless I have very, very good reason to want to read it, you know, that I've heard 
good things about it, that it sounds like something that really will interest me, or that it's like a classic that I really want to get under my belt. I don't tend to read a book unless there is a very good reason for me to be reading it. I'm not someone who just pulls book off the li books off the library shelves or, or cover buys books that I know nothing about uh, and tries them out. I don't do stuff like that. So generally I finish books because they are of some intense interest to me. But again, my mantra in this video is if you are someone who does not finish books that you're not enjoying, then I'm not here to tell you what to do with your life. You can absolutely do that. Number 16 is should the author's personal life matter at all? So this is a question in answer to which I could make a whole video. I have long contemplated doing a whole video on this subject because it's a subject that I have a lot of conflicting thoughts about and my views I think are not entirely consistent and the short answer would be no. If the work is of a high enough quality, then no, the author's personal life shouldn't really matter, I don't think. There are caveats to that, I think. I think a lot of people, when they learn about an author who is a terrible person or has said something they don't like, they don't want to support that author by buying their book. And I, I get that completely. But there are other ways you can get that author's book. You can go to the library, for example. You can always find a bootleg copy somewhere. Uh, but also I think what's important to keep in mind when it comes to not wanting to read a book by an author you don't like in order to not support them financially, what's important to keep in mind is that when you buy a book, the majority of the money for the book doesn't necessarily go to the author. There's also the bookstore, there's the publisher, there's the translator, if it's translated, and so on and so forth. That when you when you pay sixteen dollars for a new book, you're not just putting money right in the pocket of the author. There are a lot of other people involved in the making of a book. We like to think that making the making of a book is something that's done mostly in a by a solitary person, but it's not. It's done by a lot of different people. So when you buy a book, you're not just supporting that person. You're supporting a lot of other people who may not be terrible in the way that that author is. But then. On top of that, if you buy it from a used bookstore or a thrift store, then you're not putting any money in the author's pocket either, right? You're putting money in the pocket of a, a thrift store or, or the used bookstore. So, you know, I, I, th I think I, I tend to be critical of any absolutist answer to this question. I tend to be very critical of people who say that if the author is problematic or has done something terrible that you should never read their books. And I also tend to be critical of the other side who just say, oh, well, it never, ever matters. Because, again, I have caveats to my, my assertion that it shouldn't matter. Uh, part of what matters to me is how interesting I think the work is. If I find out something problematic about an author or something I don't like about an author or creator, uh, and their work isn't interesting enough for me to engage with, then it tends to be easy for me to just say, well, then, okay, I'll just forget about them because uh, they don't sound like a good person and because their work doesn't sound interesting enough. But ultimately, it is the work that matters. So, anyway. So, you're probably getting, based on my answer here, that my my thoughts on the whole subject are very sort of contradictory and vague and nuanced. So, again, maybe someday I will make a whole video about it, but we will see. Uh, number seven, if you could only read one genre for the rest of time, what would it be? It would be history, even though I don't necessarily read a ton of history uh, on a yearly basis. I do think that reading only history would allow me to continue to learn about and experience the things that I go to books for. You know, when you read history, you get great stories, so you have entertainment, and you have great characters, so you have what you get in fiction as well. Or you at least have interesting characters, and always great characters if you're reading about terrible people. But you get fascinating characters. But you also learn about a lot of things. You know, you can learn about science, you can learn about philosophy, uh, anthropology. Obviously you're learning history, you learn about cultures, different cultures, uh, geography, uh, space travel, whatever. You can learn basically everything through history. So I would definitely want to read history just because I think it it, it includes the most other subjects under its net when you read about it. 
Number 18, do you ever read a book without knowing anything about it? No, like I said in answer to an earlier question, I don't read a book unless I have good reason to think that I will find it quite interesting. You know, not necessarily that I will love it, but that I will at least find it interesting and worth having experience. So, uh, no, I, I will not read something that I just found somewhere and know nothing about and just open it and start reading. Uh, even if it is a book that I found in like a used bookstore or something that I know little ab knew little about previously, I will always look it up before I buy it and make sure that it actually sounds like something that sounds worth my time. So no, I do not read books without knowing anything, and knowing anything about it. Number 19, what author, genre, series, or culture can you just not get into and why? For me, it's self-help. Uh, I just, I mean, I, I think self-help books are just kind of, I don't know, they're just pointless. <laughs> uh, I feel like most of what we do to help ourselves is just basic life advice. And so it's just it just strikes me as a redundant genre, and a lot of it strikes me as charlatanry as well. So that would be my answer. Number tw And number 20, the last question is, do you think everyone should read and why? Well, yeah, I kind of wish everyone did read, because I think it is such a great way to expand your horizons. You know, sometimes I learn, I'll learn something in a book that just blows my mind completely. You know, something that I could never have fathomed was true. And I'll just think, wow, isn't it amazing that there are people in the world who just don't read and will never know about this, you know? And so I do kind of wish that everyone did read. But on the other hand... I think that there are many ways of engaging with our universe. Some people do it through books. Obviously, you're on booktube, we're biased. But some people do it through music. Some people do it through films. Some people do it through their scientific studies. People do it in all sorts of ways. And I don't necessarily think anyone is less valid than reading. And I primarily do see reading as just a, a way of kind of engaging with the universe that doesn't have to do with actually going out and doing things. Uh, so, so yes and no, <laughs> I guess. Anyway, those are my answers to the philosophy of reading tag. Thank you for creating the tag, Brandon. It was a tough tag to do, uh, but I think it was very worthwhile. So I will uh, leave things at that. Give me your comments if you have them, if you have uh, thoughts, and I will talk to you all soon.